Good morning, brethren. It's been great to meet together as a family of God to share His word. I always say that when we gather here as a church, it's an opportunity for us. It's like a workshop where after going through the week, we come here and then we service ourselves for the next week ahead of us. And so I believe that we will all listen with rapt attention and then get something that we can use for the week. I love stories, so I would like to begin with story, and uh, I will tell several of these stories. There were two people who were living as neighbors. One was a hunter with wild dogs. The other was a farmer. And so some of the times they were sharing war, fence war, and some of the time the dog would jump over the wall, especially when they are hungry, and then eat some of the, the, the animals that this hunter was raising. And so it went on for several times, and the other man was not happy. So another same incident <coughs> happened, and so the man decided to seek some legal advice. He went to the judge in the city and reported the issue to him. And then the judge said, yes, I can let the law punish him. <laughs> but let me ask you, do you want to have your neighbor as a friend or as an enemy? The man said, I want to have a neighbor as a friend. Then the man said, then let me give you a little advice. So the judge gave him, or the, 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 the farmer, some advice. And when he went home, he started implementing the advice that the judge gave. So what he did was to take two of the lamb and give it to the neighbor who has some wild dog. And the, the children of the, the, how do you call it, the hunter, began to pray with the animal or the lamb. And so because they have found interest in the in the lamb, he decided to keep them safe. And what he did was to put a cage, uh, put the dogs in a cage so that they don't kill the animals that the children have developed interest in. And so since he did that, there was the dogs did not jump over to go and kill the lamb, and so there was peace between the two neighbors. And mm -hmm. anytime the man went to hunting, he brings some of the game to his neighbor, and the neighbor also will also share some of the products of his farming with the hunter, and so they coexisted peacefully. And so this morning, I want to talk about loving your enemy loving your enemy who is an enemy that's the first question so i was going through some of the dictionary definitions and i want to give some of the dictionary definition of an enemy according to million webster dictionary an enemy is someone who tries to hurt another someone who seeks the failure of another an enemy is someone who hates you and wants to harm you. The person who opposes you or competes against you. So as you sit down and you listen to some of these definitions about enemies, the question is, who is your enemy? What are some of the names that come to your mind about some of these acts of enemies? You all have one. All of us here, we have enemies. If you don't have, at some point in time, you may have it. And for the kids among us, yes. If you may not have an enemy today, at some point in your life, you will live to have enemies. Sometimes we get enemies because 
of our actions and inactions. So the things that we do create enmity between us and other people. But sometimes people will hate you for no apparent reason. People will just hate you by virtue of your color. People will hate you by virtue of your height. People will hate you by virtue of the work that you do. Even the position that you have in, in whatever work that you do. So because we live in a cursed world, enemies are bound to happen. And so that is why we need to live peacefully with our enemies. So when I ask about who are your enemies, I don't know the list of people or categories of people that came to your mind. But it might probably be your schoolmates, your workmates, and even your neighbors. So long as you have interaction with people, you are bound to have enemies. So these are some of the people that we have as our enemies. But sometimes enemies are closer to us than we think. So people, as we were thinking, some will be looking at, some might have even forgotten about enemies. Maybe we created some time, some past ago, some time passed, but now we don't have any more. But whatever the case may be, we will still, we have, or we may have had enemies before. But as I said, we look at our neighbors, we look at our classmates, and then we look at our uh, co-workers as some of the potential enemies. But in fact, when you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, let me quickly take you there, Matthew chapter 10. And so the first place, or the hope, is the first place to look for enemy. People within you, around you, they are going to be your enemy. And Jesus mentioned that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36. Oh, let me, let me even start from verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son sorry, I think I'm reading from the wrong one. Okay, so let me start from 35. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And so I say that the, the home is the first place to look for enemies. So Jesus mentioned a couple of relationships that can go south. He talks about a father and a son, a mother and a daughter, a mother-in-law, and then a father-in-law. We can extend or extrapolate the list to cover a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, uncles and aunties these are people that can be our enemies in fact sometimes as we live as husband and wife the people that we tend to love they tend to be our own enemies and so that is the situation we find ourselves sometimes people we just wonder how come people who have uh swear to love each other for the entirety of their life will go to the extent of sometimes even one trying to kill the other. That is the state of humanity that we find ourselves because of the cursed world that we live. And so we look at the 12 disciples of Jesus. These were close people, people were very close to him. But among the 12, there was a Judas who always do something to help Jesus. And so, as we live our life, as we encounter people, we should take it that out of every 12 people that we meet, there's a potential for one of them to be our enemies, whether close friends, families, or 
whatever that we can think of. So what are we supposed to do with such people who do something to cause hurt our friends, who hate us, who oppose us? Now let's go back. I think the reading that we have, let's go back and then critically analyze the reading there. So let's turn our Bible back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Matthew chapter, so I'm going to read over, so we listen. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and send rains on the just and on dust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even task collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even task collectors. Do you say, you therefore must be perfect as your father is perfect. And so if you read the account critically, this is part of what we call a sermon on the mount. And on five occasions, Jesus mentioned the word you have heard, you have heard. So Jesus was teaching from a principle of teaching that that is known as teaching from the known to unknown. So Jesus will start from what they already know and then extend the teaching to where they need to be or where they don't really know. As you know, teacher Jesus was a master teacher, but in this particular verse, Jesus has to correct a fundamental distortion in their understanding of the word enemies. In fact, they have, the Jews have distorted the word of God to the extent that they have subtracted some part of the word and then added some to it. So Jesus has to fundamentally address those issues. So is there anything like so my first time I heard about that is what we have. We have some, is there any Bible quotation that says we should hate our enemies? But Jesus said, you have heard. So it was not that Jesus was talking about what the Bible actually teaches, but what the rabbi, that the teachers have actually taught based on their understanding of the word of God. And so let's go back to Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 that is where this idea about loving your neighbor is leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. so we're looking at is that a teaching of the bible that says we should love our Neighbors and hate our enemies. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So here, you see that the teaching is that they have taken yourself from the passage that God has given. So they, they made a hedge around the word of God. So they created a hedge around the word of God that they subtracted yourself from what the Bible actually teaches, and then because of that, they have a stringent idea of our neighbor. Who is a neighbor? 
So their understanding of a neighbor is that a neighbor is my own people, my kinsmen, people of my own race. And so if the Bible says I should love my neighbor, of course they have subtracted as yourself from there, then deductively or in privately, I can we can say that I should then paint the person who is not my neighbor. So if the Bible says, love your neighbor, then if somebody is not my neighbor, then it implies that I should hate the person. So that is the teaching that the Jewish had at the time of Jesus. And so Jesus had to correct that. As I said, they created a hedge around the concept of neighborhood. And so it was difficult for them to know their understanding of the word neighbor. That is why I think somewhere along the line, somebody met Jesus Christ and asked, what can I do to be saved? Jesus told him, do this, do that. And then he asked, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus used the story of the Good Samaritan to illustrate the concept of neighbor. Because in their mind, a Samaritan is not... Is their worst enemy for the Israelites. But Jesus said, that is the person who is your neighbor. So Jesus saying, love your enemies, he was setting a very high standard from what they already know. Of course, they have to understand that it is not only love your neighbor as yourself, but you have to also love your enemies as well. In fact, it's one of the difficult, if not the most difficult command of Jesus. In reality, it's very, very difficult to think of loving somebody who hates you, who wants to do something against you. To love that person is a very difficult one. Difficult not in terms of our understanding, because it's very clear, it's not something philosophical or it's not theologically difficult to understand. But practically, to demonstrate or to uh, have obey that command is very, very difficult. And so when we are faced with the reality of someone who has done something terrible to hurt us, our feeling, we are tempted to disobey the commands of the Lord. It's because we tend to love with emotions. Our understanding of the word love is emotion. We love with our own emotion. But the word used there in the Greek is agape. And agape is love we give. It's an unconditional love. Love we give to somebody who does not deserve that. It is a divine love. And so it has no emotions attached to it. And we are supposed to obey that as a commandment of God. It's not like we can we can just pick and choose which commands of God we want to obey because it suits our course. It's like a story of a father who left an inheritance for his children and he gave them three principles after his demise on what they are supposed to do. He told them, children, uh, I want you to put up a fence around this property. And so the, the, after the, the kids look at the will and say, yes, that is the exact place where the heart or how do you call it? A fence needs to be placed. The second one was, children, I want you to put a ban at this specific place in their property. And then the kids look at each other. Could there be any better place to put a ban than such a place where father has chosen? Father is a genius. And then he comes to the last point. Then he said, children, I want you to dig a well at this point. And then the children look at each other. 
Father was genius. Is this actually the right place for the world to be dark? That has said yeah. So they chose to dig it in a place that suited them. But in two of the three stipulations, they were willing to obey their father because they thought or they felt that is where the, the thing ought to be. But when their will collided with the will of God, what did they do? They chose to overgo or leave the will of God behind and do their own. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. You have to obey that as a commandment of God. So what I always say is that as, as Christians, we like this concept of love. That is how I, I say it. it's a command. And so command has no emotions. It's like obeying a traffic light. You don't, sometimes you, you don't feel like when it is red, you don't feel like stopping. But the rule says stop, so you have to stop. You have no emotion. Your emotion says go, but the law says stop. So what do you do? You stop. And that is what we have to think about when we are supposed to love our enemies. So if so, what I'm saying is that if God has dealt with us the way he felt about us, then we don't have love us. That is why the Bible says, Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for us. Whilst we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ didn't look at the way we were to love us, but he demonstrated his love for us. And that is what he's commanded us to do, so that we can be the sons of him. So the command to love our enemy may be the most difficult thing for us to do, but it's also maybe the most Christ-like things that we can do as followers of Christ to be the light and the salt of the world that we live in. I read a book about a young man named Musab Hussan Yusuf. He was a Muslim and then he converted to Christian. And he was a leader of a group of uh, Muslim terrorists, if I may say. I mean, so for them, for the Hamas, maybe some of us might have heard about them. And he wrote a book about that because his father was the leader of the Hamas group. And he called it, he titled it, The Son of Hamas, a gripping account of terror, betrayal, political, unthinkable choices. And in that book, he expressed the idea that Jesus' command to love our enemies is the only way to address the peace in the Middle East. And yes, I believe that yeah, it is the one that will save the world that is engulfed with hatred leading us onto wars within for within uh, our countries and between countries. So we hear of wars within countries and between countries. If we don't obey the principles of God, of Jesus Christ, love our enemies, then this idea of hatred and killing one another is going to continue. So let me talk about some few things that we can do to love our enemies. How can we love our enemies? What? We should greet them. Jesus said, if you greet only your brothers, what benefit will it be? Sometimes we tend to avoid people who we see as enemies. And so, but saying hello to them and smiling at them, that is a good first step. Somebody may say, what happens if I greet and the person doesn't respond? We are not in control of how people will react to us. Ours is to do what we can by our own nature. We are not to respond to people by their own nature, but we are to respond to people according to our own nature as Christians. So it doesn't matter. Continue to do that. And there's a point when people that 
we perceive them to be enemies, they will break down and then they will come to understand that we genuinely mean something for them. So that's the first thing we talk about. We can look at we need to greet them. Don't let, let us not avoid them when we see people that they, they, they are competing with us, they are hating us, let's be friendly to them, let's say hello to them. That's what. The next point from the reading is to do good to them. Do good to them. The world will say, get even with them. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says, no, do good to them. How do we do good to them? But let's turn our Bible to Proverbs chapter 25. It talks about how to treat an enemy. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 to 22. Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Can you imagine that somebody who, who is in need, and, or somebody is an enemy and is in need, and then you are the first person to turn out to give support to that person. The Bible says we should do we should do good to those who are our enemies. If they are hungry, we should feed them. If they are thirsty, we should give them water. So for the kids among us, we should take we should think about that. I've told you that a child will come, you all will have enemies. Some of them you already even have in your class. But you don't if you have a trophy. And the person that you, you seem to know that this person doesn't love me, you shouldn't hide away or shy away from them. Let's, that's what Bible teaches that you should do good to them. So somebody has said, to return an evil for evil is devilish. To return good for good is human. But to return good for evil is divine. Let me take it again. To return an evil for good is devilish. So it's clear. If somebody does something good for you and in return you do something bad, that is a wicked act. To return good for good is humanity. That's human. So as human beings, we tend to do good to those people who are also good to us. But to return good for evil, that is divine. And that is what God wants us to do. To, to do, to return good for evil. And it reminds me of a story about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was one time a president of the United States of America. And when he was vying for or campaigning for the position of the presidency, there was a man who was his town's enemy. This man went around the length and breadth of America saying all negative things about Abraham Lincoln to the extent that he even used his stature as a, as a source of things to denigrate his character that you don't even want somebody who is lanky and skinny to come and Leaders, for those of us who have seen Abraham Lincoln picture, you will know that that was just skinny like me, but quite tall, not like short like me. And so this man went around campaigning, but fortunately, Abraham Lincoln won the presidency. And it was time for him to select members for the various portfolios. And he was, you know how it is, people will definitely love you. And, here and there. Then it came to one position, which is the Secretary of War. And then he made a proposal that he's going to give that position 
to one stunting. And so when the advisors heard about the need, they asked, Mr. President, do you know that man? Have you heard about what all sort of things that he said about you? He literally didn't want you to become president. Lincoln said, yes, I've heard it. Uh, I even read some by myself, but after looking out throughout the whole country, he is the best man for the job. And so Lincoln did not think about the fact that this man was my great enemy. He gave him the position and then, well, in some context, people might, they, they will refuse to accept that. But this man also accepted it wholeheartedly. And unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And during the funeral, this man made a lot of comments and said a lot of positive things about Abraham Lincoln that actually immortalized him. And so the point is that if Abraham Lincoln had seen him as an enemy, you have gone home, you have died hating this man, and that man will also be dead and they still be hating themselves. So the point is that hate cannot drive hate. As darkness cannot drive darkness, it is only love that can drive enemies or hate. Light can drive, drive darkness. So we shouldn't go on hating people because we, they hate us. We should rather do the opposite, which is show them love, and then they will tend to be. A classic example of showing, uh, how do you call it? Uh, dealing with or showing love to people who hate you is found in the book of Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's turn our Bible to 2 Kings chapter number 6. And I'll read a brief background. So there, there was, used to be war between the Syrian army and then the Israelites. They were always fight, you know how in the Old Testament people used to fight. But when the Syrian army or the king make any strategy to defeat the army of the Israelites, they will overcome that. So the man thought, what is happening? Is there anybody among us here who will always go and share our plans and strategies with the Israelites? Then the servants said, no. There isn't anybody among us. But there's a prophet in Israel. His name is Elisha. Even the words that you use in your bedroom, this man hears about it. And then he will inform the king of Israel. That is why. So the man, the king said, Where is that man? Go and find him. So they said, This man is in Dothan. So in the night, the king of Israel, sorry, the king of Syria sent armies to surround that small town. And so when it was morning and Elisha woke up, they were surrounded by armies from the, the Syrian, uh, Syrian army, sorry. And then Elisha prayed that God strike these people with blindness and actually God did that. So then he told them, the man that you are looking for is not here. So now they are blind. Let me take you to the city where they are. So now let me pick up from verse 20. Second Kings chapter 6 verse 20. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. So these are soldiers who were coming to Kill Elisha, they were enemies of Israel, and now they are found them in the midst of a fortified city. So it's war. Now they can't have any place to go. So what do they do? As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? That is human thinking. If my enemy is if I find my enemy, then if he's in the pit, I should not even I should even cover him with mud. That's, that's, that's our, our thinking. If, an, if you find an enemy that is in the pit, you need to 
bring a ladder to let him come out. But he said, my father, shall I strike them down? Look at the answer Elijah said. You shall not strike them down. You strike those men you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow. Set bread and water for them to eat, for them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrian army did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Hallelujah. So that is the power of love. He said, after they have eaten and they were satisfied, they went and they never came again. You think if the, as the king was suggesting, if he had killed the, the men, would they have, would the Syrian army have left them? They will also come back. They will retaliate. They will have retaliated. And so that is what Jesus is teaching us. If your enemy is hungry, give him food. And so that is the point we are talking about here. That we need to do good to people because, as I said, light is the only way that can drive darkness then the third point is we are to refuse to speak evil of them sometimes we tend to talk a lot of things about people when we see that we are not in good terms with them we say all sort of things against them that is what jesus meant by saying bless those who curse you so when people say a lot of things against us we shouldn't do like us. we should always say good things about them it is not easy, as I said. It means you must choose not to think or speak evil words about those who hate us. That is what we are supposed to do. And finally, we are to pray for them. Hmm. Not easy, but we can still do it because there is a command of God and we need to obey that. As I said, commands are meant to be obeyed and so sometimes if you don't feel like praying just just tell just tell jesus that i don't want to pray for this person but as uh, your word says i'll pray jesus will understand you so jesus we need to jesus said we should pray for our enemies it's practically difficult to to pray for somebody but that is the only way we can bring them into friendship and so Jesus demonstrated, not only talk about that, he actually demonstrated that when on the cross, when his enemies have put him on the cross, he actually prayed for them that, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That is what we are supposed to do as Christians. And so this morning we look at, we talk about the fact that God, has, God wants us to demonstrate higher standard of living, not as in the world way, but in the way that he actually likes. And it's difficult, but we can only do that. We can only do that through his grace, by our own strength, by human effort. We cannot do that. But by the nature of the fact that we have been created anew, we can depend on the Holy Spirit to be able to love our enemies so loving our enemy is not something simple from the human point of view we need the grace of god to be able to do that and so in ending we like to ask god to give us that grace to be able to love our enemies as ourselves and as in the words of martin luther king that we will be able to matriculate into the university of eternal life because we have the power to love our enemies to bless those who curse us to even decide to be good to those who hate us and we even pray for those who despitefully use us may the lord bless us shall we stand up and then sing